begin with the Gasho. Everyone join me in Gasho. Namu Ami Dabatsu. Namu Ami Dabatsu. Namu Ami Dabatsu. Well, thank you, everyone, for gathering uh, today for our event uh, to focus on uh, the second of the three poisons, which is anger. So this is a sort of a three-part series. We had a session on greed, and uh, we're going to discuss anger today. And there'll be a second session on anger with uh, Dr. Uh, Reverend uh, Takashi Miyagi in July. And then there'll be uh, the third one on ignorance, uh, which will be uh, later this fall. Uh, today's event is the Center for Buddhist Education event but it's uh, put on by the subcommittee of the CBE, which is the Living the Dharma LTD subcommittee. And they organize uh, lectures and events like this that focus on the practical side of Buddhism, the practical application of Buddhism. Uh, today, we're very uh, fortunate to have as our uh, guest speaker, uh, Dr. Larry Ward. I met uh, Dr. Ward at the May We Gather uh, memorial service that uh, Professor Duncan Williams put on that uh, was a memorial for the victims of the Asian hate crime uh, in Atlanta, Georgia. And so in the back room of the Higashi Honganji Temple, I had a really wonderful conversation with Dr. Ward and I thought, gee, I sure would like to have him as a speaker for a BCA event someday. He gave a wonderful Dharma message. So let me just uh, read a brief uh, bio on uh, Dr. Larry Ward. He is a senior teacher in the Buddhist Zen master Thich Nhat Hanh's Plum Village tradition. He brings 25 years of international experience in organizational change and local community renewal to his work as director of the Lotus Institute and as advisor to the Executive Mind Leadership Institute at the Drucker School of Management. He holds a PhD in religious studies with an emphasis on Buddhism and the neuroscience of meditation. Larry is a knowledgeable, charismatic, and inspirational teacher, offering insights with personal stories and resounding clarity that express his Dharma name, True Great Sound. Larry's introduction to Buddhist practice began in Calcutta, India in 1977, but it was not until 1991 when Larry met Thich Nhat Hanh that his practice became the center of his life and service. He was ordained as a lay minister in Tay's Plum Village tradition in 1994 and a Dharma teacher in 2000. He has lived in spiritual community and has assisted Thich Nhat Hanh throughout the world, accompanying him on peacemaking missions in China, France, Korea, and Vietnam, as well as throughout the USA. And as I introduce uh, Larry, I would just first like to offer my condolences and sympathies for the passing of his great master and teacher. Uh, I have uh, revered and respected Thich Nhat Hanh over the years of my ministry. I have utilized his books uh, for various study classes, uh, discussions, and Dharma talks. It was such a tremendous loss for the, the whole spiritual world uh, to lose uh, Thich Nhat Hanh. Uh, so let me begin with that and uh, turn it over now to uh, Dr. Larry Ward. Thank you so much, Bishop. I am honored to be with you and those gathered here. This is a beautiful series. Uh, I appreciate you making it available. Uh, from a practice point of view. And these three poisons are so intertwined with one another that not one of them is a separate self. Uh, as I practice with anger myself, I discover it has many factors, many causes, and many conditions. I want to read something to you from uh, Germany, uh, written by a pastor there, I think is a Lutheran pastor, who in the beginning of the Hitler movement was sympathetic toward Hitler until they start to see the outcome. And this is what he wrote. And I'm reading this because I want you to understand where I stand in this. 
first they came for the socialists and I did not speak out because I was not socialist. Then they came for the trade unionists and I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. And then they came for the Jews and I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. And then they came for me and there was no one left to speak. I read that because I want you to uh, understand a little bit of uh, how much I identify with your suffering. I grew up in the civil rights era, the Jim Crow transitional era, and uh, I maybe was about 25 before I discovered in myself why I was so angry as a black man living in America, if I can use that term. What I realized was how much of my own life energy was going into making white people feel safe. I discovered how exhausting it was, how demoralizing it was and how it made me disappear. So as I've learned to work with my anger, which I continue to do, even though I will admit it comes much smaller now, thanks to the practice, it arrives less often, but the seed of it, which is in every human being is still there. And it can be activated, it can be nourished, it can be watered. Part of the experience of this reactivity of the last 10 years and particularly since 2020 and the uh, disrespect and brutality and violence uh, you have found in your, your particular and your larger community is because in my view a new world is being born. What we're seeing in this racist reaction to everyone who's a little bit different in some people's view uh, is a response to the old story about what it means to be human disappearing and a new story emerging. And it's a story in which all of us can fit, all of us can create, all of us can love and be sustained as we live our lives. And there are those who are threatened by that new story. There are also those who are threatened by the demographical shift, as you already are aware of, in the US. There's a theory that is driving some of the behavior, the horrifying behavior you in particular may have been experiencing as an Asian community. It's called the replacement theory. So if you've not heard about it, look into it. It will help you understand the craziness that is around white supremacy right now. And this craziness is also true in Europe. It's not just in the United States. Uh, it's basically a theory that has two parts. One is that white people are going to lose their rights because non-white people are gaining rights. White people, part two, are gonna lose their power because non-white people are gaining power. I'm speaking institutionally now and economically and culturally. So it's important for me to understand my anger in the context of where I am. I'm living in a country that has tried to kill me in particular more than once. My wife and I lived in Idaho for a time 20 years ago. We had our house firebombed and escaped fine. But uh, when the police investigated, the first question to me was, I need your enemies list. And I said to them, I don't have one. I refuse to live that way. And then they told me the attack was coordinated by the Aryan Nation, a white supremacy spinoff group in, in I Quarter Lane. I know. We were traumatized 
angry, hurt, disoriented. Um, and we immediately had the luxury of being able to go to Plum Village and spend a few weeks with the monastery there and with Thich Nhat Hanh. The most important thing he said to us is you have every right to be angry, but you do not have a right not to practice with it. And we found that that wisdom to be um, healing and challenging <laughs> at the same time. So for me, the antidote to dealing with anger has two parts, just to be brief. One part is understanding what anger is. And a lot of us have, in my view, have been miseducated about what anger is. We look at it from simply a behavioral point of view, though that's a part of it. But underneath that behavior is the human nervous system, our amygdala, our neurology that responds to the feeling in the sense of threat to protect our very lives. This is normal human wiring. There is nothing wrong with the experience of anger coming up in your body because it's a bodily response. So that's the first thing I've learned that I'm a human being <laughs> and human beings experience this energy of anger. And as I looked into my own experience of anger that is full of disappointment, of grief, of hope, uh, it's full of life, even life I'd rather not have. So to understand anger as an energy that exists in our depth consciousness and Yogacara Buddhism, they talk about storehouse consciousness. In every human storehouse is a seed of anger that can get activated externally and activated internally. So how I practice with that awareness is I have learned to listen to my body I can tell when I'm getting angry now very fast. I can feel it literally rising in my body and I have learned how to get to it before it comes out of my mouth. I have learned how to handle my anger before it gets into my hands and can cause harm. So I don't deny the experience. I recognize the experience in my body. And I've learned the skills of trauma and resourcing myself, uh, which is another aspect of the anger we experience. Many of us who are uh, people of color, to use that phrase, uh, for centuries, we've had anger building up. We have layers and layers of trauma created by mistreatment and misrepresentation and erasing our very creativity and genius, let alone slavery, the railroads, indigenous servants, I could go on. You understand this already. So that's the first part of the antidote for me is to understand the causes and conditions. The second part for me is understanding how to practice with this energy. And so one of the ways I practice with the energy of anger is every day before I get out of bed, I do a meditation on what's called the five remembrances. I'm of a nature to grow old. I can't escape growing old. We were talking about that a little earlier before we began. I am of a nature to have ill health. I cannot escape ill health. I'm of a nature to die. I cannot escape death. Everything I love and everyone I cherish is of a nature to change. I cannot escape the experience of loss. And the last one is my actions are the ground on which I stand. I cannot escape the outcome, the consequences of my action. And so every day I go back in different ways through that remembrance so that when I put my feet on the floor and get out of bed, I have a fresh clarity of what it means to be a human being. Because I know those five things I remember 
I can remember about you. I can remember about everyone, however they look, wherever they're from, this shared experience of humanity. So I practice to remember that. So when I see someone else's suffering, I can recognize someone else's suffering. So the spiritual work of, of uh, the antidote uh, for anger, uh, in addition to learning our bodily responses and our reactions, and many of us have habit patterns around anger. Uh, it's, it's one of the reasons this is a poison is because it can easily become the fuel for your life. It can easily become the dominating, motivating factor of your thinking, your speech, and your behavior. That's what the teaching about anger is about. And so for me, it's learning how to practice self-compassion. Because I've discovered I get angry about being angry. <laughs> I get angry because I'm tired of being angry. I'm tired of being hurt. Uncomfortable. Feeling unsafe. So part of the self-care practice of compassion for me is learning how to resource myself with what is true and beautiful about life itself. I remember the life of the Buddha and I practice remembering that life. I remember the life of Thich Nhat Hanh and I practice remembering my experience. I, I practice remembering the life of Martin Luther King who I encountered as a high school student. And those memories create in me enough space to hold my anger without my anger taking over my mind. I don't run from anger. I don't pretend I'm not angry. I said to a group of people once who were all pretending they weren't angry about something, didn't you see that truck that just ran over your foot? <laughs> what, what's the matter with you? Can't you tell what your body is saying? So for me, anger is first of all information. Something's amiss. There's a threat. There's a hurt. There's a harm. And so compassion is bringing my attention back to that harm, that hurt, that mistrust, and creating the space of equanimity inside myself to hold it without denying it. And once I can hold it without denying it, I can transform my anger into light, into the light of awareness of compassion for myself and the light of awareness of compassion for those who cause me to suffer. A lot of people are confused about compassion. <clears throat> they think it's pity, deeper than pity. Compassion is the recognition that we are all empty of a separate self, like the trees, like the river, like the birds, like the Buddha. And to learn to rest in a state of compassion at the same time being clear and wise about our action as we respond to both our external situations and conditions that create this anger and as well as our own internal conditions and habits and trauma and whatever else we have within our nervous system. There's a discourse in the Plum Village chant book. I won't read it because it's too long, but I want, it's, it's called The Five Ways of Putting an End to Anger. I'll just read the, a few sentences. My friends, if there is someone whose bodily actions are not kind, but whose words are kind, put your attention on the words of kindness. Do not devote your attention to their bodily unkindness. The second way, 
If you become angry with someone whose words are not kind, but whose bodily actions are kind, if you are wise, you will know how to meditate in order to put an end to your anger. And there's each one of these teachings has a metaphor and a, there's lakes and other images that help communicate how to practice with it, where to take your mind. It's the same with someone whose words are not kind, but bodily actions are kind. Give your attention to the kindness. The third method. When you see someone whose bodily actions are not kind and their words are not kind, but there still is a little kindness in their heart, give your attention to that little kindness in their heart to see if you can nourish, increase, nourish, help flower that little bit of kindness. The fourth method is if there's someone whose words and body actions and in whose heart you can't find any kindness, <laughs> yes. what, what do you do? If you're angry with such a person or group, when you see someone like that, give rise to this thought. Someone whose words and bodily actions are not kind and whose heart is nothing that can be called kindness. It is someone who is experiencing great suffering. Unless he or she meets a good spiritual friend, there will be no chance for him or her to transform and go to the realms of happiness. The fifth way, if you see someone whose bodily actions are kind, whose words are kind, and whose mind is also kind, give your attention to that triple kindness. And do not be overwhelmed by your own anger or jealousy. If you do not know how to live happily with someone who is kind, you cannot be called someone who has wisdom. And my experience of both personally and socially is every day I have to practice with looking for this kindness, these kinds of kindnesses in my own life and at my home, in my family, in my relatives, uh, and friends and strangers. So I've been training myself, training myself to look for this kindness. One more story for you. When I studied theology in Chicago, which I did for over 20 and taught for over 20 years, I used to have a t-shirt. This was in the 60s. And from the Old Testament, there's a statement from the book of Psalms. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. That's from the book of Psalms. But there was a t-shirt that said, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because I am the meanest son of a bitch in the valley. And I meant every word of that on that t-shirt at that time. And then one day, about, one day, about five years later, a friend of mine came up to me and says, I saw you smile for the first time. What happened? I had begun to practice. I had begun to come home to myself. I had begun to study. And now I have a t-shirt that says Ocean of Compassion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Larry. Such uh, practical applications of, of how to deal with anger. Uh, you know, I think that's something kind of lacking in our Shin Buddhist tradition even though the founder of our tradition, Shinran Shoni, talks about, you know, the greed, mm -hmm. anger, and ignorance <laughs> within yeah. him. Uh, he doesn't write so much about, well, but how do we really deal with it? Mm -hmm. So, uh, so wonderful to hear some of these uh, uh, 
things you've shared, like getting up in the morning and those those remembrances. You know, my first thought in the morning is, "Gee, what am I going to have for breakfast?" <laughs> to be thinking of of those five things, it really puts uh, kind of the day in perspective. Uh, I was going to ask you, uh, since you studied uh, with Thich Nhat Hanh, if you could share some any personal stories or remember remembrances about uh, Thich Nhat Hanh, first of all. Well, in addition to the time we spent after our house was bombed, uh -huh. I had the pleasure of traveling with him around the world for different uh -huh. retreats and book tours. And uh, in the second visit, in his return to Vietnam after 40 years, mm -hmm. I remember doing walking meditation with him through the jungle mm -hmm. in Vietnam. And while we were walking, there was a group from, I think, Germany, who were still picking up mines that were oh. in the ground from the war. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And uh, I stopped with Thich Nhat Hanh. We asked the group, you know, how many mines did they collect every day and how long would it take to get rid of all this? Because there are people in that neighborhood, in those villages who are missing arms and legs and et cetera, because of those mines still exist. So we stopped and we took a look at who the makers of the mines were. What was that? What was that word again? Who the what? The manufacturers. Oh, manufacturers. Manufacturers. Okay. Uh-huh. Um, and Thich Nhat Hanh whispered in my that the practice of engaged Buddhism is not to live in the dark. So I took the name of those, that company, came back home when I did, and researched the 10 manufacturers who were fundamentally uh, supplied mm -hmm. the mines uh, during the Vietnam War. And uh, he reminded me, when you look up these names of these companies, can you do that with compassion? Oh. Can, can you do that recognizing their ignorance? their confusion, their hate, their greed, and to then turn the mirror back on yourself and ask yourself, where, where am I falling into this, this trap mm -hmm. uh, of greed, hate, and ignorance? And uh, that was a wonderful thing. We spent some time in Gaoming Monastery in China uh, for a week, and we shared practices with the monastic community there. It was uh, interesting to see Thich Nhat Hanh adjust to another, another practice mm -hmm. and being willing to learn. And so, cause some of the monastics with us were like, hey, we shouldn't be trying other people's practices. <laughs> and Thich Nhat said, well, how will you learn? How you actually learn what your practice is if you don't know what anybody else's practice is. Mm -hmm. And so we, we had a beautiful exchange of different practices. We would do uh, Pure Land, mm -hmm and then do mindfulness and then like that. It was beautiful and uh, had an impact on the Plum Village community uh, in terms of how we now celebrate, honor, do ritual uh, and uh, chanting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I've seen his ability to adapt and learn uh, from others, which for me is, is a hallmark of uh, you know, authenticity. Mm -hmm. uh, in a teacher or a person. Mm -hmm. uh, one more story is uh, we were invited on a book tour in Seoul, Korea. His book on anger in Korea yes. was a bestseller. <laughs> and, <laughs> and we had a retreat there for a week, all focused on the book. And I had several people come to me during the retreat after the first day or after the second day and say, I'm still angry. <laughs> and I said, that's okay. At least you know. At least you can recognize this pain, this discomfort. Now we're working on how to have compassion for yourself in that experience. And during this time, because it was a book tour, the group of us, which is only about 20 people, monastics and lay, got put up in the Hilton Hotel. Uh -huh. 
And so we had a group of lay people from Europe, not many, just a couple who were upset that Thich Nhat Hanh was staying in the five star, star hotel. So the next morning after we checked in, we all had breakfast together as a Sangha. After our morning chant and acknowledgement of the Buddha, Thich Nhat Hanh said, the Buddha says it's great to stay in a Hilton hotel. <laughs> <laughs> and then a week later, we're at one of the oldest monasteries up in the mountains of South Korea, a thousand year old, I think, monastery. It was so cold, we could barely breathe. And the next morning at breakfast, Thich Nhat Hanh says, it's wonderful to, to be at a cold monastery. <laughs> and his, his capacity for equanimity, uh -huh. live, equ living equanimity, uh, was just a great joy to be around and a wonderful teaching all the time. Uh, uh, for those that uh, have it, are familiar, I don't know if you can see, uh, this is a book, Anger by Thich Nhat Hanh. And so I've used this quite often in the study class and discussions. I have a funny story about this book. After I, I shared it with our, with our Sangha, when I served as a minister at Orange County Buddhist Church, one, one, uh, one man came up to me, he said, you know, Reverend, it made me so mad my wife gave me this book on anger and says, here, you need to read this. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. So were there episodes where you saw Thich Nhat and you, and you were just sort of astounded, like, how come he doesn't get mad about this? Well, I, to tell you the truth of my experience with him, I went to my first retreat with him in California 30 years ago at an invitation of the woman who became my wife. And uh, when I read the brochure and found out he had been nominated by Martin Luther King uh -huh. for the Nobel Prize. And then yeah. I went back through the history and in his first book, uh, Lotus on the Sea of Fire is a letter to Martin Luther King mm -hmm. asking him to explain the difference between immolation and crucifixion, the difference between immolation and suicide. And Martin did receive those letters and did respond. And so they built a relationship over time. Uh -huh. And uh, I was in Plum Village for, uh, used to go every year for Christmas and as well as other retreats. And the first Christmas I was there, he gave a talk on how he practiced with the death of Martin Luther King. Oh. And uh, he said he had to do walking meditation all night mm -hmm. in order to recover his own personal stability mm -hmm. and his own faith in a country that would just so easily kill a bodhisattva. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that it took him all night, all night of walking on the ground to Plum Village in tears and breathing mm -hmm. uh, to receive that, that news. Mm -hmm. um, so it was a very personal experience for him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can you share uh, any story or remembrance of meeting uh, Martin Luther King as a young teenager? <laughs> Well, in 1967, Martin had decided, and a movement had decided to, that there was just as much racism in the North as there was in the South. <laughs> and so the movement was going, was moving North, uh -huh. Uh -huh. heading towards Chicago. Uh -huh. and, but in 1967, he stopped in Cleveland, Ohio, which is where I was born. And he gave a presentation at my high school. Oh. Boonville High School, and I was, uh, I had come in the door, and I was making my way to the, to the men's room, and out comes the principal, Mr. Clayton, and Martin Luther King. Oh. <laughs> and he, he just looked at me and said one thing, how are you, young man? Oh. I never forgot, I understood the levels of that question, Yeah, yeah. and uh, changed my life. Hmm. Wow. As, as bodhisattvas do for many, many beings all the time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I've got to spend time with Andy Young, who was close to uh, Dr. King, 
And so I've, I've been very fortunate to meet many people who've been associated with him very close mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and still have, are alive to tell the story. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Sure. Can you share a little bit about, so you were not, obviously you were not brought up Buddhist. No. Uh, but how you encountered Buddhism in Calcutta or in, in how you gradually made that oh uh, sure that, that, that crossing <laughs> over to Buddhism I my parents um, were from the Pentecostal Protestant tradition uh-huh and they were involved in founding a little church in Cleveland Ohio uh-huh and and in my and my grandparents uh, attended a what they call the high church or big church, which means their minister went to seminary. <laughs> and uh, my grandmother was just ruthless on poor theology. But anyway, uh, so, but I, nobody could explain anything to me. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. I've been always a person who would ask a question. Mm -hmm. And we'd have big events and ministers come in and at the end, you know, lead communion and invite people to uh, join the church. And one year there was 300 people at our revival and we had a communion and 299 people went to the altar except one. And that was me, which upset my parents, and uh -huh. the church. And I just simply said, I know what's going on here is powerful. Mm -hmm. But if you can't explain it to me, mm -hmm. I'm not getting involved. Mm -hmm. So 10 years later, 15 years later, when everybody learned I was about to become ordained as a Christian minister, my grandmother said, well, we better go to the service because he might be lying. We need to see this. <laughs> <laughs> we need to see this live. So I spent 20, 25 years with the Ecumenical Institute. Uh, before being really focused with Thich Nhat Hanh. The Ecumenical Institute was uh, started after World War II because there was a recognition that one of the problems in Germany uh, was that the church was not unified in its opposition to Hitler. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And so uh, an organization called the Ecumenical Institute was started in Basel, Switzerland, to, to build better ecumenical relationship, working relationship, project relationship between traditions in Christianity. And, uh, but as I was a staff member in that organization over the time, I, a part of our discipline was study. Mm -hmm. And so I had a chance to study Buddhism. I had a chance to study Hinduism. I had a chance to study shamanism and Confucianism, et cetera, Taoism. Mm -hmm. And um, so I've always liked to study on my own. I just read and study, mm -hmm. and then I try to practice it and see what happens. <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, in 1977, I was sent to Calcutta uh -huh. uh, in our little religious house there to work in the neighborhood. Uh -huh. It was one of the poorest neighborhoods in Calcutta because we did social economic development. And I was at the market one day, and this this person came up to me in a, kind of a monkish monk outfit, monastic outfit, and said, well, what are you doing here? And mm -hmm. do you know there are 11 million Hindus here? <laughs> so, yeah, you're the only black person I've ever seen in Calcutta. And I was explaining what my, you know, my organization, our commitment. And he says, well, you know, the Buddha taught close to here. Uh -huh. It would be a shame for you to be here and not learn anything. Uh -huh. And the next thing I knew, I was involved in sitting meditation and walking meditation and tea discussions and about the meaning of life and the meaning of practice. And after I left Calcutta, everywhere I got stationed, the first thing I did after landing was finding a temple in which to practice. Huh. So I've had the, the privilege of practicing the Soto Zen tradition, uh -huh. the Tibetan tradition, with the Pokemon Shan tradition as I did my uh, uh, PhD work at uh -huh. uh, the University of the West in uh -huh. yes, yes, yes. California as my alma mater. Mm -hmm. And um, so I've had just the wonderful experience of, how should I say this, the transparency of the practice. Uh -huh. I was practicing in, with Pokemon Shan 
five or six years ago. I was there for several weeks and I went to practice every morning, which was all in Chinese. Yes, yes. And after the first day, the abbot came up to me and says, you're back again. Do you understand Chinese? <laughs> I said, no, I don't understand Chinese. But what I do understand is energy. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. The Dharma is not just about words. Mm -hmm. It's about sound. It's about vibration that moves through our body like it moves through time and space mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so when i'm in japan which i really enjoy teaching and learning in kyoto uh, in particular uh, just being in a temple i don't have to say anything i don't have to do anything there's so much lineage of energy there mm -hmm. of practice there that if i just don't try to achieve anything i can relax into the wisdom that is there on the ground Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You so know, I got inspired by Thich Nhat Hanh. Everywhere we went, we'd go to a temple. We went to a place where Master Empty Cloud taught. We were going up the steps. Thich Nhat Hanh turned to me. He liked to show off Westerners <laughs> as practitioners to really encourage yeah, yeah. the Vietnamese uh -huh, uh -huh. to step up their quality of practice. <laughs> uh -huh, uh -huh. And we were going in this temple was the Nam, Nam, Nam Wai Temple celebrating its 1500th year anniversary. And so Thich Nhat Hanh had me really close as we went in. He turned to me and said, Master Empty Cloud taught here. Uh -huh. Study him. Oh. So as I would travel with him, he would drop these little hints. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, take up this study. Mm -hmm. Do this practice. Learn from this teacher. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I was uh, inspired mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to, to learn as much as I could uh -huh. and still uh -huh. am inspired uh -huh. about the Dharma way. Uh, you know, I, I really like your Buddhist name, True Great Sound. There's a passage in one of our frequent chants. It's called the Sambutsuge. It's from this larger sutra called the Larger Sutra of Immeasurable Life. And mm. there's a phrase, it's the great sound of enlightenment. Wow. The great sound of enlightenment. So, you know, most people don't think of enlightenment as sound mm. or as energy, you know, but uh, I, I think of that passage when I learned your it's wonderful because it's available to all of us uh, 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 uh. can you just share a little bit about uh your organization the lotus institute and what you do there uh, sure um what we do at, at lotus is we try and design programs to support bodhisattvas in the world people who bring loving presence and action in education, in schools, in companies, in communities. But our goal is to help train people so they don't burn out, uh -huh. so they don't give up, and they know how to do enough self-care. So when they engage with the issues of society, mm -hmm. they are not dissuaded or co-opted by the old ways of thinking, speech, and action. And so we have an online academy. We do live retreats in different parts of the world. Um, I'm in Mexico right now, but we've been teaching in Mexico for 10 years uh -huh, uh -huh. Uh, on retreats and with students. And uh -huh. so we try to empower local action and local sanghas uh -huh. uh, hmm. wherever, wherever we are invited and then we offer other online programs besides our academy uh -huh. weekend gatherings and celebrations and renewing people's energy and building beloved community hmm. Hmm. which i uh -huh. think is what this what we are called to do uh-huh 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 and the inspiration to start something like this came from your uh, sort of uh, encounters with Thich Nhat Hanh and those years of study? That's correct. We had just finished one of our trips to China. And our last day, we got to visit an orphanage, um, which was amazing. These children, young people were just amazing human beings. And it happened to be my birthday, uh -huh. and uh, which I never make a big thing out of, but somebody found out. Uh -huh. 
And uh, all 50 of the children came out and sang, we shall overcome to me. In perfect harmony. Broke my heart, open again. Compassion again. Connection to what is deep and true and beautiful about our human existence. Uh -huh. And so I, I, I came down the stairs the next morning with a draft plan for what we call the Thich Nhat Hanh Academy. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> and so I went over to the breakfast table, sat down with him and a few others and said, I'd like to do this. And he said, that would make me very happy. Mm -hmm. And so then we started Lotus under the name of the Thich Nhat Hanh Academy. Mm -hmm. And then six months later, as the monastic community began to grow, mm -hmm. we realized if we name it that, it will be confusing. Uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. It's not a monastic training program. Right, right. So we right. changed the name to the Lotus Institute inspired by the teachings of the Lotus Sutra. Uh -huh. Oh, how interesting. Wow. You know, there's a question in the chat, and then I'd like to present that, and then I'd like to uh, invite anyone to uh, put a question into the chat that I can sure. post to you. Uh, there's a question from Mary. Uh, she writes, do you think that anger is an offensive reaction and self-preservation instinct to fear and anxiety? Fear and anxiety are automatic physical changes in our body, but anger appears to be a conscious choice. It's not a conscious choice at first. It is an impulse. It is a response of our nervous system to threat uh -huh. or harm or hurt. This is the neurobiology of it. It depends then how you deal with that experience. That's the practice part. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's no escape from the human experience. Mm -hmm. The whole purpose of the practice of Buddhism for me is to understand our human experience mm -hmm. and learn how to practice with it well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it does not create suffering in ourselves or can alleviate suffering in ourselves and does not create suffering in the lives of others. Mm -hmm. So yes, that's it, it's, uh, we've been taught that it's bad to be angry. That's not correct. Mm -hmm. what's, what's quote unquote bad is to use the energy of anger as your fuel for your life. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Because when it becomes a fuel for your life, it is out of control. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And all kinds of damage and destruction can occur. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, Kathy Fong has this question. What is the name of the book where the five ways of putting an end to anger is found? I think that you, you. Uh, it's the Plum Village Chanting Book. Oh, so that's only to students uh, who study at Plum Village? Not necessarily. It's a public production. Anybody oh. can get it online. Oh, okay. okay. It's on Amazon and it has been for many years. Uh huh. Uh -huh. Okay, great. Some people chanting. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Uh -huh. Let me pose another question. Uh, if anyone else wants to submit a question in the chat, I'd be happy to present it to, to Larry. But uh, don't you see the sort of rise and prevalence of anger in our society and culture around us today? Maybe part of it with the pandemic, uh, part of it. Uh, uh, I don't know. It just seems like we see it no matter where we where we turn. Uh, I agree. Uh, uh, we see it, but it has always been there. Uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. What's happened both politically, especially, is the seed of anger and discrimination uh -huh. and hatred and all the poisons have been watered. Uh -huh. They've been fertilized <laughs> by rhetoric and behavior uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. and the energy of fear is stalking our nervous system a little bit everywhere not just here in the u.s but around the world mm -hmm. and uh, more about the u.s you cannot create a society like this based on genocide based on slavery mm -hmm. based on the abuse of other human beings for the sake of profit without creating anger. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
as a major fabric of your cultural reality, energetically. Mm -hmm. And now everybody has fallen into the pit. You know, Yogacara Buddhism has a great you know, image of uh, perfuming the world with how you, the qualities of your practice. And mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. America, when I met Maladoma Soma, a young man from Africa, his tribe sent him as a teacher to the US because his tribe identified themselves as the people of water. And he was sent to the United States to bring water to help us put out our fire. Hmm. Anger burning mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in our souls. Mm -hmm. And that anger is both inherited and is conditioned mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. over and re reinforced and re-empowered and you know, we have movies celebrating how great it is to be angry, how wonderful it is to take revenge, how great it is to kill somebody. Mm -hmm. You can't create a culture like that without consequences mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to our very psyche and soul. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what, this is always so amazing to me, what, if you look at history, whatever it is that the quote unquote, most marginalized people may have experienced, under domination becomes the next illness of the dominator. Mm. Hmm. So we have people here today pretending slavery didn't happen. <laughs> What's like, oh, <laughs> what, what, I mean, it's, it's just amazing to try to forget that is a response to having more grief than you learn how to handle. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm because no society can get created that way without everyone being traumatized. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We tend to think, oh, black people got traumatized, oh, Native Americans, uh, Asians got traumatized by what, the system of white supremacy. Also, the system of white supremacy itself is traumatized, mm -hmm. destabilized, mm -hmm. incoherent, mm -hmm. and unhappy. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you. Sure. Koichi uh, has the question. Go ahead, uh, Koichi. Hey, Dr. Ward, I really like what you said that, you know, anger, it's it's just inherent, you know? I mean, I can't agree with you more. You can't control it, right? That's that gut reaction. Yeah. What I wanted to ask you was, you know, all of us have met people in our lives that are just these kind of calm souls, right? You notice that you've met people that don't tend to get as angry as quickly. They don't have uh, a, a real short fuse. For me, even uh, Bishop Harada Sensei is one of those people to me. I, I find him to be a person that doesn't jump to anger so quickly. In your experience, what have you noticed about those particular, like, is there any commonality to their lifestyle or, or habits that they have that make them maybe a little less apt to jump to anger as opposed to somebody like me who, who is a little <laughs> more fiery? You know, I get angry so easily. Well, from a nervous system point of view, it's a tricky question because many people have uh, equanimity confused with what in, in nervous system language is a nervous system freeze where you go numb, where you stop feeling and you can appear to be at peace uh -huh. only on the surface. I've been with people who were extremely peaceful on the surface, but if you went to the next level, it was a madhouse. <laughs> okay, and this is especially true with groups of people. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. You know, groups of people can change the world for good or for ill. And, and so what attracted me to Thich Nhat Hanh, the first time I met him at the retreat I mentioned, was the pre his presence his presence. He was non-defensive. He didn't justify anything. He just walked out on the stage and sat down. No words. And I knew at that moment that was the energy I wanted to be close to. Mm -hmm. That peacefulness because I knew the history. I knew about the assassinations of students in the, in the, the youth for social service community. I knew about the immolations in Vietnam by monastics, one of whom was in our community as a core member of our order of interbeing. 
So I knew the history. I could feel the history before I even met him. But when I met him, his peacefulness, how would I describe it? It was centeredness. He was not out of balance. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. His body and mind seemed to be arrived together <laughs> mm -hmm. and stay together. Mm -hmm. uh, and that gave me great solace. And I thought if somebody who's been through what he's been through can be peaceful, so can I. Mm -hmm. Wow. We have a question from Jack, and then I want to take a question from the chat from Jasmine. Go ahead, Jack. So beautiful over here. Thank you so much, Dr. Ward. It was really a pleasure to get to hear you and um, so value your practice. So thank you for that. And um, thank you for the Reverend for putting on the event. I'm really grateful to have stumbled upon it. Um, I, I was hoping if you could just expand a little bit more. Um, uh, you, you touched on it in relationship to the kind of cognitive dissonance of something like slavery. Um, and I, I was hoping, I know that for me in my own practice, I found that the idea of moralism and the society that I live in, that that deep level of conditioning about capitalism, consumerism, militarism, um, being a citizen of that. And then through a Buddhist lens, the idea that there's nothing to gain other than just a clearing of right scene, right? And being able to kind of keep coming back to my human experience. And you touched on some pretty um, severe, you know, international global atrocities um, that you've been a part of, right? And, and I guess for me, I, hopefully that's sort of forming into something of a question. It's something that I've been sitting with and kind of, um, I guess the question is the value of personally just practicing into love and to wisdom and also acknowledging the system of which we live in. And um, yeah, I, I, I hope that that kind of like makes, makes some sense. Okay, thank you. Uh, for me, the, the challenge, if I can re relate to it that way in the, world today, in the world today for those who care uh, with wisdom, and those who care with compassion is how to be engaged without being entangled. Mm. <laughs> how to be engaged in the revolution of wellness that is actually happening right now around the world. The revolution for justice has never been so loud mm. around the world and the revolution for harmony mm. has never been stronger around the world. The act attacks you see on your community and on mine, our response to change. Uh, William Irwin Thompson, who uh, I, I met, at the MIT dude, uh, brilliant, uh, wrote a book. Uh, part of his book was called, uh, it was about the sunset effect. And he was saying there's a certain time of day, if you stand in the right place and look, what looks like the sunrise is actually the sun setting. And what we see in motivating these attacks against minorities and uh, women and gender and the whole abortion thing is people trying to reestablish the mind of the 17th year old century. This is a reaction to our progress. This is not, this is not what people think it is. This, this apocalypse in the Bible, apocalypse means revelation. It means we can see things we didn't see before. And can we see things we never saw before or not? This is the moment of history we are in. And it's a glorious moment. Uh, as long as we remember whatever we create next as a society, will still have to be worked on constantly. Mm -hmm. This is, this is the, the error in the mind of the democratic systems we have in the world. It takes vigilance. It takes constant care. It's like you have a garden mm -hmm. of hope and dream and freedom, but you have to weed the garden. Mm -hmm. You got to water the garden. Mm -hmm. 
And the same thing's true about my individual practice. So people often say to me, well, you're very calm. Well, that's, that's because <laughs> I practice to be very calm. <laughs> it's not because I got lucky. <laughs> I, I practice day and night to have a, recognize when I'm in a state of equanimity and when I'm not. Uh, uh. And when I'm not, I know what to do to get back to it. Mm -hmm. This is how, why the practice is so wonderful. Mm -hmm. we are, we're never in a position of not being able to respond to our lives mm -hmm. in a mm -hmm. positive Thank way. Thank you. Thank you, Jack, for that question. So engaged, but not entangled. I really like that. I'd like to uh, present a question from the chat by Jasmine. It says, thank you, Dr. Ward. I think it was wonderful that you and your wife were able to leave right away to Plum Village after the trauma experience at home. I think meaning when you're a homeless firebomb. Mm -hmm. uh, any advice for those who do not have those abilities and are experiencing racism, whether microaggression or implicit bias consistently? Sometimes there's no room to breathe between experiences. I agree. And yes, I do have some suggestions. Part of what I've done in the last 10 years is uh, devote a lot of time and energy to studying trauma as a methodology and resilience in rewiring the human nervous system. So there are skills, not complicated skills, very simple skills, some of which we already do naturally, mm -hmm. some of which our ancestors did just naturally, but we don't recognize it. Mm -hmm. For example, the church I grew up in, I mentioned, was Pentecostal. And part of the Pentecostal tradition is people uh, has great music yeah. and singing, and people periodically dance. Uh -huh. And my mother, my sister and I would sit together in church, and we would like timer. And so we, we would watch her body, and then we would go, well, she's about to blow. <laughs> and when I study trauma, I realized what her dancing was about. Her dancing was her releasing trauma, oh. rewiring her nervous system to be able to go back into life again in the next week in Cleveland, Ohio, reconnecting her neurons throughout her whole body to joy. Mm -hmm. That's practice. Mm -hmm. So whatever you want to do to maintain your sense of evenness in life, practice joy mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and figure out every day how to do that a little bit, how to be amazed every day by the wonder of life. Mm -hmm. And I got a great quote from my wife this morning. She heard from someone that worry is devoting attention to what you don't want to have happen. Is, is praying for the wrong thing. <laughs> and, and so learning to catch that in yourself. Uh -huh. I'm working on a new book. You can see some of the stuff on the wall, but my, my challenge in writing this book, working title, Be Not Afraid, mm. is how easy it is to be afraid mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and how we're constantly bombarded with pictures of the world and each other to which we should be afraid. And so for me, writing, writing a book is a spiritual practice. And so mm -hmm. I keep telling people who are waiting, <laughs> it takes me longer because I have to process this, All right? This isn't the intellectual exercise. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And, and what's wonderful about the spirituality of Buddhism itself is it understands this is not an intellectual exercise. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Well, we look forward to, to seeing and reading that book someday. Yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> There's another question in the chat from Amy. Uh, that, Thanks, Dr. Ward. Can you give me some tips to let go of my anger? Uh, yes. Uh, there are several things that I've learned and through my experience. One of, one of them is to, if it's to speaking personally, so first you have to identify what you're angry about. Mm. and with whom you are angry. Mm -hmm. And if it's a person, one of the things you can do, this is not so easy, <laughs> is you can take them a gift. Oh. And the process of looking for a gift for them, choosing a gift for them, 
starts to change your heart. Oh. But this is not the first step. <laughs> the first step is to recognize the suffering in that person. Hmm. Understand that human being. And we, we see this in schools where I've done a lot of work with mindfulness and getting it into schools. And we see in the bullying mm -hmm. uh, habit and pattern, which is worldwide, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, this inability to handle our nervous systems, our anger, our fear. Uh, and it, it can be learned. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We do not have to have our children or ourselves live mm -hmm. in such a debilitating way. That's not necessary. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We have a question from Stacy and Eugene. You go ahead and unmute yourself, Stacy or Eugene. Hi there. Thank you so much, Dr. Ward, for this. This is so timely for me. Um, I appreciate that you say anger is information. And it's what we do with that information. <laughs> that I guess ultimately um, helps us or hurts us. Mm -hmm. um, and with starting with the self, I, I also appreciate that, that anger is a physical response. It's telling you something is going against maybe what you, what you think should be happening, what you think is true, what you think is right. And when you feel like you're completely surrounded by people or situations that are going against your, your gut, mm -hmm. um, it can be a very physically um, exhausting kind right. of world to live in. And so what, um, what Jodo Shinshu has done for me is given mm -hmm. me the awareness to catch myself when my body starts to go into that mode yeah. because it happens without my consciousness. Right. I just physically go there first, right. but my practice has taught me how to catch that moment, mm -hmm. redirect that moment, mm -hmm. breathe with that moment. And all I want to say is that sometimes I get it right and sometimes I get it wrong. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the first nine people, I get it right, but that 10th person, man, just <laughs> knocks me off my center. So. Right. Just, but there's really not a question here. It's mostly just a comment that that anger is information, and and we all behave differently, right? Some yes. of us fight, yes. Some of us use flight, exactly. and some of us just freeze. freeze. And you brought up right. the people mm. that we get the impression that they're handling everything so lovely, and actually they may not be. They've just got an outward persona. They might be fooling us all, but they're not exempt from the things that, that kind of trigger most of us. So anyway, just thank you. I just wanted to thank you for your talk. Glad thank for you. what you do. Uh, well, thank you. I wanted to mention a resource uh, where I've studied on trauma and resilience that's based, skill-based. It's called the Trauma Resource Institute. It's located in Claremont, California, where I used to live and where I taught at the School of Education on uh, Mindfulness. But the Trauma and Resource Institute, it has a great website. It has training for therapists and non-therapists. Uh, it has training for psychologists and just ordinary people, training for school teachers. Uh, about six years ago, I was... My wife and I were here in Mexico to respond to the traumatic occasion of the earthquake. Mm -hmm. And so we worked with a group of psychologists uh, for a week and giving them some basic skills uh, to help their clients and themselves be able to process their way through the impact of the trauma. But we didn't just work with psychologists. We actually worked with individuals in the neighborhood families and then who are interested and willing to do that work. And I'm back in Mexico and I can tell you it really helped. Mm. But the Trauma Research Institute has done work around the world with trauma in Haiti and then the earthquake in China, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so it's a great resource, wonderful training program. Um, and I, I know the founder personally uh, and I've worked with her 
as, as well. And so I've integrated uh, trauma practice with mindfulness of the body, mm -hmm. the first foundation of mindfulness. And actually our Lotus Institute has an online course called the Earth Gate, mm. Earth Gate. And it is a nine session series on learning how mindfulness of the body can help you heal trauma. Mm. And it goes through a summary of the practices of those six skills and includes the meditation. It's a great resource. Hmm. So that's something you can check out on our website. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. We have an interesting question from Lynn Ray. How do you think social media and internet affect our nervous system? Oh. <laughs> well, 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 first of all, it, it, it nourishes reactivity. Uh huh. Uh huh. It creates the sense that we have to immediately respond. And there's nothing more dangerous right now in the world than reactivity. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So learning to slow down, learning to pause, you know, it took me a while to understand what Thich Nhat Hanh meant about mindfulness. It isn't just sitting in a zendo, it isn't just walking, it isn't just all the things we might think. Those are all important part of it. But what he really means is to create a lifestyle that allows you to do the practice. <laughs> and so our dilemma in the modern world and how it's structured and how it's managed and the habit energy that drives it makes it extremely difficult to create a life that can be slow enough where you can recognize the miracle of being a human being mm -hmm. and recognize the miracle of this planet, mm -hmm. recognize the miracle of one another. We're too busy. <laughs> Either we're too busy or we're worried about being busy yeah. or we're exhausted. You know, I, I've spent time in, on trains in Japan and other parts of the world, but in, I was thinking of that tonight. I was, we just had a session with some Japanese students yesterday, but uh, where people are just students and, and workers are just yeah. on the train asleep. That's right. That's right. Absolutely exhausted. I watched a documentary on the isolation issue in Japan. Oh. The people withdrawing from society. Oh. Young, young people who won't come out of their house. They do everything oh. on the internet. They order all their food oh. and have it delivered. And I saw this interview with this young man who said something like, I, this is not the kind of society I want to live in. I want to live in a society that wants me. Huh. Not for what I can do, not for how much money I can make someone else, but because I'm human. Hmm. Because I was born. I want a society that wants me to have a life. Mm -hmm. Not a society that wants me to give my life away. And as wow. I listen to young people around the world, more and more of them are saying, hey, this isn't this is this is working. This is this is this is not working for me. I see no future here. Huh. And so part of that fuels the suicide a dilemma, which is global, by the way. Every there's an increase in suicide around the world in geography, and the age range of suicide keeps going down. Mm -hmm. And this is most true in modern societies. Hmm. Hmm. Well, you know, we we, it's like our children, we just thrown them into the river of forgetfulness. What's supposed to happen to our children? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they feel that, they can recognize that they are second and third thoughts. Hmm. Hmm. One of the other things I heard from a young man in China recently was that whatever we mean by an adult, is not right. Hmm. We have children K through 12 feel they have to become activists because their classroom and the adults and families in which they live will not address real issues. Oh, we've got students walking out of schools here in the US and other places like Greta walking out of school and sitting in 
So I think we need a new definition of what it means to be an adult. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Really. Mm -hmm. Because our younger generations, I can recognize wisdom that is quote unquote adult wisdom uh -huh. in non-adult bodies. <laughs> yeah. And we have to recognize this and put our arms around these young people and support their vision and love of the earth uh -huh. and love of each other, contrary to how we've been conditioned. Okay, here's a question from Karen. Uh, echoing what Dr. Ward said about violent movies, don't we live in an environment of manufactured anger in the media? It is a celebration of high passion for anger that may not even be our own. We are so susceptible to the display of passion. So I guess it's more of a comment, but. Uh, yeah, it's a brilliant comment and it's really true. And uh, a good resource to read if you haven't read it already, it's called The Manufacturing of Consent. Manufacturing of Consent. Is, oh. is how societies condition their citizens to be okay with what is really not okay. Oh, I see, I see. Huh. And every society does it, whether it's conscious or not. That's part of, uh, uh, you know, in order to be together, we have to be together. We have to figure out how to do that. That's not what I mean. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about the conditioning of the three poisons. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's what it really means to be a member of the society. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You're okay. not really impressive if you're not greedy. <laughs> you don't hate anybody what's the matter with you I mean, uh, I mean really we need to see how the paradigm is trying to pull us backwards uh, uh, uh. here's that little comment from uh, Stacy and Eugene uh, social media design creates an intentional pathogenic environment we can recognize and choose a moderated participation as anger management. This is from you, Jim. Yes, uh -huh. that's what I do because I know if I turn on certain TV programs uh -huh. or news programs, yeah. Yeah. My, wife said, my wife says to me, if you turn that on and you listen for two minutes, you're going to explode. <laughs> <laughs> I just get, my word is not anger anymore. As I get furious. <laughs> Uh, at the incompetence and uh, miss, I mean, it's just amazing what we as humans will let other humans get away with. Uh, uh, and one of the things about us as humans is we are very susceptible to being fooled. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We are really, really very susceptible uh, uh, <laughs> to, to being fooled, to being confused, uh, uh, to being disoriented. Uh -huh. and kidnapped by these three poisons if we get dressed up right. Uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. Okay, maybe we'll just take one or two more questions or comments uh, if there's anyone else. If not, then uh, uh, we might uh, uh, conclude this wonderful, wonderful. So Koichi, go ahead. No, really quick. Uh, again, this discussion is so great. I just wanted to comment on how valuable it was when you said anger makes us reactive, you know, right? You said it makes us reactive. So the biggest takeaway I've taken from today's session is since I cannot necessarily always control my anger, what I can control is my reactiveness to the anger, right? So before you react to that anger and give into that anger, take a breath, take yeah. a moment. And this is true for whether you wanna draft that angry email or post that social media comment. The right. best advice we can take away is, you know, just just try to compartmentalize that for a minute and take 24 hours before you do anything. And that might save you a lot of life trouble, right? <laughs> One of the things I learned through my trauma training, which I continue to do with different people, the same kind of staying on the scientific edge of all these things, is to you learn the language of your own nervous system. So each one of us needs a little map of how our body responds to our human experience so we can recognize it when we can name it, not be shamed by it or mm -hmm. fall into judgment about it. This is our human experience. It needs to be honored mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and respected and loved and loved in the sense of cared for. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, 
That's the language I've learned. So I can, I can read my body now. I can read, hear the messages coming from my toes. <laughs> I'm, I'm starting to get pissed off here. <laughs> and, I, and my foot told me. <laughs> and so it's wonderful to be able to be in touch with your whole system. Uh -huh. And not that it's perfect, but that it is a process. So I'm learning every day more and more about how to be a human being capable of loving myself and others in the midst of suffering, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. in the midst of the three poisons mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that still rise up in all of us. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but they are not cages. Yes, yes. We are not, you know, trauma is not an excuse mm -hmm. for behavior. Mm -hmm. It's an understanding of how that behavior came to be. Uh -huh. And in true Buddhist teachings, we need to always look at causes and conditions. And the problem with reactivity is it disconnected from the cause and condition, dip, dip, disconnected from the root of the cause. So it doesn't get healed. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It just gets dramatized. Mm -hmm. Okay, Eugene and then Jack. I just wanted to uh, quickly piggyback on what Koichi said and what you've been saying, uh, Dr. Ward, which is we, we may not be able to uh, control that anger. Uh, my takeaway for today was recognize. That's what I wrote down. And like Koichi said, we may not be able to control the anger, but we can recognize that it's there. And Koichi just made me think very quickly. We can control our outlet or we can choose something. And you know, at the beginning of this, you know, for Stacy and I, we found uh, music as a great uh, outlet yes. and, and leveler. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, Reverend Harada, I should actually say, kind of brought that brought that out in us. Mm -hmm. um, but for others, um, you know, that's I think that's what the, that's what the importance of art is is yes. some creative outlet that mm -hmm. you can choose when you recognize the anger that's correct. and then you know get a hobby that has that intrinsic right. value. But thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Sure, thank you, Gene. Thank okay. you. Uh huh. Jack. Very true. Yeah, thank you again. And I um, was just really struck by the example in particular of the uh, care and compassion for the folks that were making the landmines and, and that as a reminder. And um, just kind of piggybacking on those takeaways, just the alchemy and the catalyzing of being able to feel the depth of anger to connect to the joy, right? That you can't have one without the other, that sort of Mm -hmm. wisdom of that and um my friend leland who uh i'm grateful turned me on to uh to your your work and your practice um just this week actually i think had mentioned a, a quote that i believe he had said was Thich Nhat Hanh that it reminded me when you were um in discussion that uh maybe the next buddha is is a community is something that perhaps he said mm -hmm. and that felt just like very um, poignant to everything that you talked about as far as revolution so thank mm -hmm. you thank you well, and Thich Nhat Hanh's uh, teaching around this has to do with Maitreya Buddha. Mm -hmm. And uh, what you can find, there's lots of uh, things you can find about that, but it's the, it's the Buddha of loving kindness. Mm -hmm. And that the next shift in humanity is developing our capacity to be kind to one another and to this planet and to develop that into a systematic, not system, into an organic way of living. Mm -hmm. But that can't happen as an individual. I mean, I am the result of so many people's hopes and prayers and tears and mm -hmm. teachings I cannot even begin to discuss. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we're all such presences of our ancestors. Mm -hmm. And to understand how to work with your ancestors when they come up in your mind, um, because you will find some angry ancestors in your consciousness. And if they're not, they don't know what happened. Don't dismiss them, honor them. Because when I, <clears throat> when I heal, my father heals. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
I think that, right. Isn't there a Buddhist uh, saying that when one person gets enlightened, seven generations of people get enlightened or something like that? Yeah, yeah. We have to think of ourselves this way, yeah. not simply activists. Uh -huh. Because we are creating a stream of energy that is not containable by form. Mm -hmm. And that is what will change things. It is that energy that is starting to happen around the world mm -hmm. that's provoking the reaction we see on the right side, on the right wing, on a mm -hmm. autocratic leadership. This is the trying to hold on to sunset as sunrise. I see. Mm -hmm. I went to a conference, uh, a musical conference, many years ago. And I lived on Woodby Island and off the coast of Seattle. And uh, it was at the University of Seattle. And there was a concert on uh, German music mm -hmm. from the like 16th century. And there was all these unusual instruments and, and everything. And it was just beautiful music. Uh -huh. And uh, and incredible creativity and harmony. And it was only that music was created 30 years before Hitler. Huh. So I ask myself for the next several meditations, how does that happen? Such beauty. Yeah. yeah. And then all of a sudden, yeah. uh, kidnapped by the three poisons. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. It happens if we don't pay attention to what we cultivate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's not a complicated answer. Look at what happened in the US in the last 10 years. <clears throat> and I don't, I don't, I don't ever go back to people and say, you know, I told you so, <laughs> but <clears throat> we have got to learn to see things coming uh, uh, so we can protect ourselves, our sanity, our children, our communities. It's not over. Mm -hmm. Martin Luther King told a small group of us once, according to Andy Young, you must always remember as hard as you're working for justice, there are some people working for injustice and they have more money oh. mm -hmm. and more time. Mm -hmm. But <clears throat> they cannot change the energy of justice uh -huh, uh -huh. because justice goes around goes under goes through us all mm -hmm. well gee thank you so much uh, uh on behalf of everyone i think uh, this wonderful wonderful session uh, today and share, sharing us your uh, personal experiences your insight uh and your wonderful wisdom uh, thank you very much. Well, thank you. We'd love to have thank you again. You. Thank you all. Future PCA event. Uh -huh. Yeah, the organizers and who <laughs> contacted me and made sure I was in the right place at the right time. The <laughs> tech, all that work, I appreciate. Uh -huh. And I'd like to conclude with the uh, Gosh Show again. Can you join me in Gosh Show? Namwami Dabutsu. Namwami Dabutsu. Namwami Dabutsu.